Welcome to our Workers' World Labour Show. I'm your host, Sharik Trubadi. Also joining me is Michaela Miller with our weekly Labour News. Hello, Michaela. Hi, Tashik. How are you? Very well. What do you have for us this week? Well, we have quite a detailed bulletin today. In our lead story, Kivusa and Fawi embarked on a national strike against Clover SA over retrenchments, factory closures and working conditions. Mine workers set to go on a strike after reaching a deadlock in wage negotiations with Sibania Stillwaters Gold Division. In international labor news, the Make Amazon Pay Coalition is organizing an international campaign including strikes, protests and a boycott against Amazon on Black Friday. The People's Vaccine Alliance demands the pharmaceutical company Moderna to supply vaccines to low-income nations. In South America, unions in Nicaragua support the newly elected Sandinista government's decision to quit the Organization of American States. In the USA, the bakery, confectionery, tobacco workers and grain millers international union will re-enter negotiations with the Kellogg's company in Omaha after a seven-week-long strike. Uni Global Union affiliates demand action from government and retailers across the world to end customer violence and harassment in stores. And a collective of volunteers in the U.S. has developed a tool to track union busting through an online website. All this and more later in the full bulletin. Climate change and the impact of working class women is this week's topic of discussion. Tashrik, over to you. Thank you so very much, Michaela. Now, recently, a huge international conference, COP26, was held in Glasgow, Scotland, that discussed mitigating measures against climate change and a global agreement between countries' governments for doing so. Over the past decade, countries have been severely affected by climate change. This included flooding, droughts, and extreme forest fires. We in South Africa have also been directly affected right here in Cape Town with a severe drought three years ago and regular forest fires. In today's show, we take a closer look at climate change and its impact on us, especially upon the poor and the working class women. Before we begin this week's discussion, let's take a look at an incident produced by the Workers' World Media Productions editorial team. There is no doubt that climate change is the greatest environmental challenge of our time. A disastrous 1.5 degrees Celsius rise in global temperatures and beyond. The oceans are in a state of emergency. Entire marine ecosystems are vanishing with the warming of the seas. And as the waste of the world empties into our waters, we face the devastating crisis of plastic pollution. Mass drought, mass disease, loss of lands and homes, increased fires, increased tropical storms, mass human displacement and globally exhausted resources. No, climate change is here right now and there's a great, great impact on our climate. Where I'm from in the Karoo, we had, oh, we're just busy recovering from a terrible, terrible drought in the area and there's a great water scarcity in our area and um, to top that all off we have uh, the companies and the government that wants to do fracking in our area or oh, the small-scale farmers rather is uh, very concerned that this will destroy their livelihoods it will destroy the uh, precious and sensitive underground water reservoirs and therefore the communities is rising up and bringing out their voices against the government and the system. We would like to see climate change not only being housed within a small unit within the broader organization, but we'd like to start seeing climate change being or having a unit within all other spheres of government. 
so that climate change at the end of the day is not seen as an environmental issue but seen as a cross-cutting issue. We as per communities we are suffering the most out of this issue because we are more vulnerable in terms of our communities going back to our houses living as per one in poverty and we are also unemployed with making more hard for our communities you know to keep ourselves sustainable now what we need to do is that we need to be sustainable in order for us to live which is basically wrong and which is say our human rights say that each person has a, each person has a right to to nutrition food or even eat salt but as people go back in our communities you will see none of our people basically have access to food they have access to uh, nutrition etc just passing now you're coming to parliament we've witnessed and we've saw that as people giving out some food and we want to stop that in terms of saying to parliament adopt the chest adopt the charter and we want to say put our people before profit because now we also need to ask for food growers we need to adopt by the charter we need to adopt by the new charter we need to adopt by the climate because our crops are not growing well our crops are not doing well because of the climate change apa singo mama abai tu abali mayo apa kodwa ubumdaka ubuinomileyo ikatiam ukala pa apa glasa kona utoote ngabasali ivumba elipuma yo apa kwa strains elizekatiniam ivumba elipuma kula wetland ikikaleleka ngamanzi asuka kwa drain I affect our kulu ikatiam. In the visa gap fungu kelondole ngo bango fundi sakuam kwa kutoe is tolezam kufunika zipefumle indo fresh. Ize zikuaz uba organic. Ngo kuna ndiziva ndizbonu kuti andi mbamba ngo kwa nele yo organic. Ngesiza tu se pollution. So now we challenge ethi chonge na yu asina manzi. Apa asina toilet. Ienzeka into bana si pu me si ambe si e endle si osneta kona utingo kuseliyo endle abe umtu ongta cha e kona na ipa e bubo na ubuze bako so endke ngoku enye into e kula yo uku reichwa kwa bantu because kwa zindausi si osneta kuzo so bebe kona na bantu abango tata ku reichwa abantu ana ku reichwa ivi na bantu abatala so si pila bantu kwa lo meko apa e Burundi alu kwenye unaito esinal. Kasi funa amand ite puzi tu azi pumi mand at all. Kasi funa amand kufunika sisi sim ufugengo five x ten. Oga ni uye epsungo ten during a day amand aweko at all. Ibaluleki le ndo yokubana abantu abango mama ba fuma na mand awe nele yuko ba singa bando abango mama. I i ukando valu kulu kuti lugnagege la ba yenbe tu na bando na be tu ne family zito. And ungum to own mamma, a man's wafunanga longi crash. Go bagaloka bandabango mamma, banama crash or go bana kufune came shambi, and a shamba naga tatung a mean kuba ingum to own mamma. Southern Africa is warming at double the rate that uh, the rest of, of the world is warming. And one of the impacts of global warming on our region is increasing dryness. We have already experienced a, a series of devastating droughts and uh, the scientific indications are that these droughts will become more prolonged and more intensive. Obviously, um, South Africa is a signatory to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And because of that, we have uh, commitments to reducing our greenhouse gases. We also have um, a significant profile to adapt to the international implications of climate change. And um, like all other developing countries, we're looking forward to enhanced means of implementation, including finance and technological transfer.
Welcome back and thank you so very much for joining us. This is the Workers' World Labour Show. I am Tishirik Chubadi. Let's get into our discussion now with Francisca de Gaspins, Director at SAFSI, also joining us, Dr. Yvette Abrams from QE Life, Project 90 by 2030. Sandra van Kerk is the Project Coordinator at the Public Services International, our guests for this discussion. A very good day. Thank you very much to you guys for having joined us. Francisca, I'd like to start maybe off with you. How do we understand climate change? What exactly is it? Climate change is um, essentially a process that happens when too many um, uh, gases are emitted. And the gases that cause climate change are things like carbon dioxide, um, which comes out of fossil fuels when we burn oil in our cars or gas on our stoves or any of those. That process emits uh, carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere. It also comes from um, methane, which comes from a lot of our industrialized processes, um, whether it's farming of cows and other animals which produce methane and other systems. So what happens is these gases come out, get released into the atmosphere. And what that creates is a sort of a blanket that starts warming up the earth. So previously climate change was called um, global warming often, but really Climate change is more accurate because what happens is that you have greater variation in climatic conditions. So you have greater floods, greater droughts. Sometimes it's colder, sometimes it's warmer. And what's the reason we see that change is because of this, this blanket of these um, greenhouse gases, which are then in our atmosphere, and there's too many of them. So essentially the way that our atmosphere is composed at the moment um, is too high. And carbon dioxide is one of the measures that we use to see what is happening in terms of this climate change process, this global warming. And we've gone past, um, you'll know some um, NGOs are called things like, um, uh, um, uh, what am I saying? 350, 350.org. The, and they, um, the name is about the parts per million in the atmosphere of carbon dioxide. Yeah. And we're way above that. We're over 400 already. So we are already within climate change. It's happening already right now. And we can already see global temperature rise of around one degree already. Sure. And so that's up... what happens. The temperatures go up and then you start to see these climatic changes. And so it's something that anyone can see, you know, whether you're having a lot more rain or a lot less rain you're having unusual temperature changes. What really about it makes it unusual? I understand perhaps there is a scenario, Dr. Yvette, that the Earth is warming up as described there by Francisca, but is the Earth not self-sustainable? I mean, what, 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 what are the impacts really that come with the Earth warming up? Dr. Yvette. Well, what has happened? What has happened really the last 250 years, say, which is a, a bit of an island in Earth's time. You know, even in human time, it's, it's not that long ago. But what has happened is that we've, we've made long-term changes to the way we relate to the Earth. Um, so, for instance, the most obvious, our, our sewerage no longer goes back into the ground. So all the carbon and the humus and the compost that we used to put straight back into nature is literally now going into the sea. And when you multiply that by 7 billion human beings, that's quite a lot of carbon. Um, that's not going where it should. It's not going to feed trees and grow forests. It's going into the sea and poisoning the marine ecology. Um, and the other major change that our energy that we used to harvest from trees we now dig up from beneath the surface of the earth. So we dig up oil, we dig up coal, and we burn it and we put it in the air. So, so, so 7 billion human beings are doing things that are not particularly sane in relation to the earth. Um, I, I literally, I guess what you could say is, it's an experiment to see how long we can be stupid before something hits the fan. You, you, you know, um, for, for, for as long as the human species has existed, we have always returned to the earth what we got from it. And now all of a sudden we're digging it up in the one place, burning it up in the other place, putting it in the water, in the sea in the third place. It's going to cause havoc. Sure, but, but Sandra, but just, to pick up, just to pick up on the... Probably like 
two three year olds in your living room that that's literally what we're doing at the moment yeah two three year olds on sugar yeah so sandra just to pick up with you uh, project coordinator at public services international if, for instance, in the, in the instance of South Africa, we extract a whole lot of coal, and, and, and on, on, on what Yvette has just said there, that you know we're extracting this, we are burning it, it goes into the air, um, and as such, emits quite a bit of carbon, and those emissions are what is called climate change and threatens and brings about these freak weather conditions. Are they really freak weather conditions, or are they weather conditions as such that would be able to um, you know, make us get used to them, that it, we will be able to accommodate weather patterns like that, or are these really unusual to the point where it signifies that the earth and the, the sustainability of the earth is in serious trouble? I, th I think it's absolutely that, that the sustainability of the earth is, is in serious trouble, yes. I mean, I think, I think Yvette's right that, um, you know, I think, I think what we've got to understand is, is that we've always gone through cycles. Earth has always gone through cycles of, of, of you know, drought and, and more rain, et cetera. I think what is unique about the last 250 years is that it's human actions, th starting with the Industrial Revolution um, 250 years ago, that has caused what we are seeing now. Um, so I, I think it's got to the point now, we are now, I think, 1.1 degrees um, increase over what temperatures were pre-industrial period. And the scientists are telling us that we can't get above 1.5. So you can see we're really close already. Um, and if, you know, the scientists have told us that if we get to 1.5, you know, the planet is going to become uninhabitable. It's going to get to the point where um, it, it can't sustain humanity anymore. Um, well, was, and we're all going to... Sandra, yeah. I was going to ask, what, what does that mean? Um, when, when we reach 1.5, are, are we going to see freak nature weather to the point where we're unable to, to mitigate and or control it? Or are we looking at a scenario where, I don't know, there's an implosion of the earth, uh, you know, it signifies the day of hell? I don't know. <laughs> what, what happens yeah. at 1.5? Look, I mean, I, I'm not a scientist, but I, we're not going to see an implosion. I think we're going to see a kind of a long, slow death of living living forms on Earth as the temperature rises and gets too high. If we think about the impact on our on us as humans, so you know, increasingly, I'm seeing more and more articles talking about the impact of heat stress on the human body, the fact that it leads to heats, uh, um, heart attacks, it leads to strokes, it leads to chronic um, kidney disease. So that, for instance, you know, we reach that kind of a temperature. Public sector workers who work out in the field, um, laying water pipes or dealing with electricity lines, it's going to become too hot. For people to actually be able to work out for outside for large numbers of, of hours of the day. So, so, so that's just one aspect, the, the heat stress that, that the human body is not going to be able to tolerate. It's going to impact on our water resources. So water resources are going to be very badly compromised. The quality of the water, um, the, the, the amount, you know, the water sources are going to dry up. The quality of the water is going to deteriorate. So um, more and more cities, are going to become drought stricken, um, not have access to water. Um, we're going to see the increasing spread of diseases across the, 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 the countries, diseases that are going into sorry areas that haven't been you know that they haven't been before. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, malaria, they, they talk about the fact that we will see malaria in Johannesburg, which we know has never had malaria before, because the, te the temperatures are increasing. We're going to see increased um, cholera um, and, 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 you know, all these, 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 these um, um, waterborne diseases, we're going to see much more of that kind of thing. So we're going to see a, a huge um, a burden on the health sector. You know, we've seen that with COVID-19. It's going to be even worse yeah. um, as, as the impacts of climate change really take hold sure. on, the, on the environment around us. Sure, and I want to, I'm going to have to go to a break very shortly, but Francisca, I just want to pick up on you. Um, South Africa um, is a relatively medium, small-sized 
industrial country compared to um, the bigger ones, you know, the Russia's, the China's, the United States. Um, but and South Africa is one of the biggest um, contributors towards climate change because we have an ESCOM problem and we have a big pockets of coal that we use at the moment. Who, who would you say are the main culprits, the main drivers of this level of emission that is threatening the earth at the moment, Francisca? You know, interestingly enough, South Africa's 13th globally on emissions. So we're pretty high up on the list if you consider, um, you know, what's going on, how many other countries are of similar size and bigger. Um, our industrial system is very, as you say, um, coal and fossil fuel intensive. And unfortunately, we currently are seeing real strong factionization in our government around what is the way forward? So we're not seeing a very clear lead on decarbonization of how we're producing energy here. And in fact, there's actually a really big push towards fossil fuels. So that is a big problem for us in terms of um, South Africa's um, trajectory. I mean, South Africa isn't one of the historically responsible countries. And it's important to keep that in context, that it's the what were called the Annex I countries, the northern countries, who really develop their economies on fossil fuels. South Africa is kind of middle of the road, but we are an extremely high emitter at this stage. Sure. So we really do need to bring that into check. And we really do need to insist that our government takes its commitments very, very seriously and starts making proper planning, especially around energy procurement, so that we don't face a real climate crisis going forward. South Africa well, needs to really step up yeah, the, the crisis is very real, and in fact, that is why they are talking. They are talking about talking about dealing with climate change, and that, of course, at the COP26 conference that has just concluded in Glasgow. Once we return, we'll get into what that conference was, and really whether materially it will begin to work in benefit of the world's uh, climate, and more so the issue around the dependence on fossil fuels. That and more as we continue this week's edition of Workers World. Welcome back to Workers World Media Labour Show. We are talking about climate change, its impact on the world and more so on women in particular. And right now, I want to go to Dr. Yvette Abrams, who is from QE Live Project 902030. Uh, Dr. Yvette, I'm quite curious to understand, um, you know, the, the the COP26 conference. It's the um, not the first such meeting, and really this meeting, as I understand it, is the coming together of not just world leaders, governments, business, civil society. It's the world coming together, talking about how do we mitigate what we've just discussed in our first segment of the program. What, what is your sense about whether this is a true commitment to dealing with the issue about climate change? Um, look, I think the mere fact that it's COP26 should tell you something. And, and you, you know, when the youth started standing up, the, the Greta Thunbergs and the, and the Fridays for Future movement, um, you know, a large part of, of the climate change movement is young people because obviously they're the ones that are most invested in, in having a future. But, but I remember going to, I think it was COP 17 or 18, and seeing an 18-year-old stand there with a the sign saying, since I was born, you've been meeting, and the temperature keeps on going up. Mm. So, so, you know, the bottom line, they shouldn't even have to have been a COP 26. We've known exactly what we were telling you in the first segment. We've known this since the 1970s. It's yeah. not news, and that's it. And so... You know, too little, too late, I think, is what, um, well, what springs to mind. You know, entire populations are moving. The entire island of Kiribati, for instance, they bought land in Fiji. And the whole nation of Kiribati is moving to Fiji because they cannot live on their island anymore. There's too much salt water infiltration in the wells. I mean, we'll probably see this in Cape Town as well. Our biggest problem is not so much sea level rise as such long before our houses get swamped we're going to notice that we, we're pulling up salt water from the wells and this has happened in Kiribati Maldives, Seychelles marginal areas, places like Lisbon and Namibia could well be also follow that path of, of being uninhabitable so COP26 I'm not impressed 
Um, well, well, I guess the good I, I thing put, about I, I want to put you, I want to put you, Yvette, that at COP26, they're talking about a just transition. Um, and there appears to be some form of an experiment at the moment that says, let's throw some money towards a place like South Africa and Africa, and it will fund through bonds and loans their transition away from coal into these greener, um, cleaner forms of energy. But this just transition seemingly applies to Africa only when Africa to begin with didn't get us into this problem. Why does it appear that there is a disparity here in to whom and to where this supposed just transition applies? Um, I, th I think for me and, and, and of course the others can also help here with one million climate jobs where they spend a lot of time defining the concept. For me, just transition means that there must be justice for the workers as we move. I mean, take the mine workers, for instance. If your pension's sitting in coal mining, okay, for the sake of the planet, we're going to have to move away from coal mining, but we need to make sure your pension gets invested in a wind farm or a solar plant or an organic farm. The intention is not to punish anybody, but to make sure that every section of the working class, as we move towards a more sustainable way of life, ends up, if not benefiting, at least not losing. So for me, the notion of justice is very important. Yeah. So and, and also like the compensating the people who, who, who will lose entire livelihoods, farm yeah. workers, for instance. Because, Sandra, there's no denial that climate change is going to affect, uh, affect uh, the downtrodden the worst, the poor, the working class the worst. Um, where do we begin to apply this concept of a just transition from the over-reliance on coal and other fossil fuels in where they say they want to go? Do you think that this conference has gone sufficient far enough to make what they really call a just transition? No, I mean, I think I would I would agree with Yvette that 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 the the world leaders are simply not going going ahead uh, going far enough. They're not recognizing the impact of climate change on on communities. Um, and I think you know you can't deal with this problem by just saying, oh well, we'll deal with we'll deal with this coal mine and we'll um, you know we'll we'll close this coal mine and then we've sorted that you know we've we've done our bit. We have to see this as a as a as an economy wide issue where we're actually trying to decarbonize the economy as a whole, um, and we have to see this as a national issue where we are looking at how to. Um, create jobs um, um, and, and create a more sustainable um, living place um, where people can live in safety and, and, and in healthy conditions. So, you know, I think it's, it's, it's too often that the idea of a just transition gets reduced down to, well, we'll just have a, we'll just deal with one little place and then, uh, you know, we've, we've done our bit. No, we actually have to do this as a, as a whole country and say, how can we um, have a more equitable, um, how can we have a, 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 um, a more just um, economic system? Uh, I think, you know, maybe just to, to raise this point is, is that, it is the, 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 um, the poor, the working class, who are most at risk and most vulnerable from the impact of climate change, from extreme weather events, from yeah. droughts, from uh, heat stress, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and so we, we need to um, have a government that is taking seriously its responsibility for, for um, ensuring access to basic services as a way of trying to build the resilience of communities as well. So I think that's also another issue that yeah. we definitely need to be taking into account. Francisca, can we afford to make this transition? I mean, we are heavily reliant on coal as a source to produce energy, and we know the problems with ESCOM at the moment. Um, and we've just built Kusin and Madupe, which are overly reliant on coal. Uh, coal is also seen as a strategic asset for South Africa, not just in terms of energy production, but also as a, a source for economic activity Activity and that being a, 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 a particular um, type of, of, of resource, for instance, that is being going to the export market. So I'm quite curious to understand, can South Africa, given our current economic situation, can we afford to decarbonize and completely move away from coal? Well, I think the question is, can we afford not to? Um, the reality is, is that coal already causes huge um, pollution issues lung damage, there's many, many communities who really suffer from our reliance on coal. So that being said, you know, there's 
there's there's many active um, communities and NGOs who are campaigning to stop us from coal, just in terms of health impacts. But you know, this is not a um, this is and and I think uh, Sandra and Yvette said this very well. It's not meant to be a punishment. It's not meant to be now you've done wrong, so now you're going to have to suffer for us to address climate change. In fact, it's an opportunity for South Africa. We have, and as Safsi often says, God-given sun and wind in abundance. And renewable energy is actually cheaper now. Um, there was recent news that renewable energy, it's cheaper to stop running a coal power plant and completely create a renewable energy system than to continue to run the coal power plant. So economically, it makes more sense to move away more quickly from coal. What we need to make sure is that if we plan properly, we think about it properly, and we make sure that workers who are going to be affected or anyone who's going to be affected adversely from moving from coal to renewables is accounted for, just as the other panelists have said, that we think about it very carefully. Planning for this can be done. Many countries around the world are already doing it. Many countries around the world already rely solely on renewable energy for some parts of the day. And all of the, we've been hearing a lot of very strange arguments from government around why we need to stay with coal and not necessarily just government, other vested interests. We've got to remember that when we look at how political systems work, it's often those most in power, business as usual, as we call it, who influence government to keep those systems running. But we need to see systemic change as Sandra was saying, we need to see a real change in how we do energy provision, how we create energy, and how we think about our, our communities. As people have been saying, the poorest are most hardly hit, hardest hit by um, climate change, especially women in this. It does have a gender component. And we need to think about that very carefully. South Africa has a serious challenge in terms of looking after it's populist that we need to allow people to develop. We need a lot to allow them opportunities and decentralizing our energy system, taking it away from these centralized monoliths of coal, of nuclear, of the proposed oil and gas is absolutely essential when we talk about the kind of systemic change that we need to see, which is going to allow communities to flourish and allow us to become resilient to climate change. The cost of continuing to do business as usual as climate change hits, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's humanitarian costs, sure. it's loss and damage. There are many, many factors around climate change which will be a zero-sum game very shortly. Yeah. All right, thanks so very much for that. Let's take a break. And after the break, Michaela Miller standing by with the latest news. Welcome back to Workers World. I am Michaela Miller. Thanks for joining us. On Monday, the 22nd of November, trade unions Kivusa and Fawu embarked on a national strike against dairy company Clover SA over detrenchments, factory closures and working conditions. Over 5,000 workers will go on strike after Clover SA has spent the last few months targeting workers in attempts to cut 300 million rand in labour cost. Clover SA wants to directly retrench 350 workers, close four branches retrenching 300 more workers and relocate its branch in Johannesburg, which would threaten another 812 workers' jobs. The company also plans to reduce workers' wages by 20% through insisting that they accept a 4.5% wage increase, which is below the inflation rate. The two unions are rejecting these restructuring proposals as well as continue demanding a wage increase of 10%, the disinvestment of Israeli-based Malco CPC from Clover SA and the takeover of Clover by the state with democratic worker participation. The union is arguing that Malco's restructuring is part of a company's effort to reduce Clover's local manufacturing capacity in order to import dairy products from the company headquarters in Israel-occupied Palestine. On Wednesday, the 24th of November, a coalition of four unions applied to the CCMA for a certificate to strike after Sabanya Stillwater's Goals Division refusal to meet mine workers' wage demands. 
The coalition includes NAM, AMCU Solidarity and UASA. The initial demands were for 1,500 Rand monthly increase per worker per year over the three-year bargaining agreement. However, the unions have indicated they would accept a similar agreement with Sabania Stillwater that was reached with Harmony Gold and Victoria Main Reef earlier this year, which secured the following. Category 4 to 8 employees will receive a wage increase of 1,000 Rand per worker per year. Miners, artisans and officials will receive a wage increase of 6% of their basic wage for each year of the agreement. Meanwhile, Sabania Stillwater's latest offer falls far short of these demands and the united front of the four unions and their members is likely to go on strike soon. Make Amazon Pay, a coalition including 70 worker and activist organizations across the world, is organizing an international strike and protest campaign against a transnational corporation. Amazon on Black Friday, the 26th of November 2021. Strikes and protests are planned in multiple cities across at least 20 countries on Friday. Cape Town is among the cities that will participate as activists plan to protest the construction of Amazon's regional headquarters on sacred land in observatory. The action is part of the ongoing Lisbic action campaign in the area, connecting local struggles to the international campaign. Globally, the campaign is intended to combat Amazon's growing corporate empire, Make Amazon Pay has released a list of 25 demands which range from calls for improved working conditions to ending the company's support for climate denial denialism. The list highlights Amazon's dependence on labor exploitation, climate destruction, tax dodging, mass surveillance and securitization. The People's Vaccine Alliance has demanded that major multinational pharmaceutical company Moderna supply vaccines to low-income nations and end its commit commitment to vaccine apartheid. The alliance, which includes 87 civil society groups, sent a letter on the 16th of November to the Moderna CEO laying out a set of questions and demands. Thousands are dying each day from COVID-19 while Moderna keeps its vaccine out of reach, said Max Lawson, co-chair of the People's Vaccine Alliance. Any and all of the company's spare capacity should be used to ramp up vaccine manufacturing. But there is another huge pool of untapped global manufacturing capacity that Moderna CEO Stefan Bansel can unleash if he immediately shares the technology and know-how needed to manufacture Moderna's jab, especially with the WHO's mRNA hub in South Africa. The National Union of Employees representing 500 public sector unions in Nicaragua supports the Sandinista government's decision to quit the Organization of American States. The Nicaraguan government's decision has come two weeks after the popular left-wing Sandinista front was voted into power. The OAS is notorious as an international body which serves the interests of the U.S. imperialism in Latin America. Feared in losing political and economic control over Nic Nicaragua, the U.S., EU and the OAS have responded to the democratic election with a coordinated campaign to undermine stability in the country. Like in the case of Venezuela and Bolivia, the U.S. President Joe Biden signed the RENESA Act which imposed a set of harsh economic sanctions on the Nicaragua to pressurize the people for regime change towards more capitalist-friendly capitalist government. In response, UNE has come out in full support for the Sandinista government and its decision to leave the OAS. In the USA, the, this week's workers at the Kellogg's plant in Omaha will re-enter negotiations with the Kellogg Co. after being on strike for over seven weeks. The nearly 500 employees have been on the picket lines around the clock since the 5th of October this year. Union members' demands include a contract that does away with the company's two-tier wage system that turned 30% of the workforce into transitional workers who earn $12 less in hourly wages, lost their retirement benefits and incurred higher healthcare premiums than their union-protected counterparts. At the request of the Kellogg Company, the workers' union agreed to re-enter negotiations earlier this month. 
However, these negotiations soon broke down when it became clear that they were a smokescreen for the companies to manage the strike narrative ahead of an annual shareholder meeting. Just over a week later, on the 11th of November, a temporary restraining order was placed limiting what the union members could do and where they could set up. With the strikes living by the slogan, one day longer, one day stronger, the representatives will be expected to remain true to their, to their resolve in the latest round of negotiations. Uni's commerce sector held an international webinar on the 17th of November 2021 where over 100 union representatives from 30 countries met to discuss the high levels of customer violence towards workers across the retail sector. Existing patterns of violence and harassment have been worsened during the COVID-19 as customers across the world are responding to requests by workers to wear masks with aggression and violence. Jaron Dyer, National Secretary of the Australian Union, SDA, said that a survey of retail workers found that one in five have been deliberately spat or coughed on during the pandemic. In Sweden, Thea Homeland from Handels Union revealed that 28% of women in retail have experienced sexual harassment by a third party the last 12 months. Following the meeting, which was proclaimed a united day of action, the uni has released a declaration on violence and harassment, which calls on government to ratify international agreements, as well as consult with unions on new legislation, penalties and sanctions that can provide protection in the workplace. Employers are also called on to implement measures which will protect retail workers from customer violence. And lastly, members of Labor Information Center Labor Lab, based in Helena MT in the US, launched a feature on their website called the Union Busting Tracker, which can be used to report and track union busting practices in the US. Among the guilty companies is Amazon, who hired a consultancy with the state aimed to educate workers on unionization in such a way to intimidate them with lies to put them off joining a union. Initiatives such as the Labour Lab's Union Busting Tracker assist in the fight against the parasitic nature of capitalists represented by companies like Amazon who fear an organised working class. Well, that's it up from my side. If you have any story you'd like to share with us, you can send a WhatsApp message or voice note to 081 552 or simply send us an email to labour at wwmp Org .za. Stay tuned as Tashrik Truebody concludes this week's topic of discussion on climate change and the impact on working class women right here after the break. Welcome back to Workers World Media Labour Show. We are talking about climate change and its impact on the world, particularly on women as well. Unfortunately, we've lost Dr. Yvette Abrams, uh, so we'll wrap up this last segment with Francisca de Gaspins, the Director of SAFSI, it's on the line with us, as well as Sandra van Niekerk, the Project Coordinator, Public Services International. Sandra, I, I want to pick up with you on um, you know the fact that a lot of our discussion thus far has heavily relied on you know describing what what climate change is, how how we got here, the role of carbon emissions, um, and I'd like to know what a world with less carbon emissions actually look like. Um, and, uh, you know, Francisca there had spoken about uh, greener, cleaner forms of energy and diversifying our, our energy sources. Um, renewable energy is a very broad term. Tie it down for us. How, how do we go cleaner and greener? So renewable energy it refers to things like solar, solar power, solar, you know, PV panels on roofs. Um, uh, you can have a, a whole utility size of P PV panels, which can generate, you know, a lot of electricity. You can have wind farms. So those are all forms of, you can have, um, um, you know, geothermal energy those are all forms of renewable energy um, and that's what we refer to when we talk about um, renewable energy but i think it's not only renewable energy that we need to be focusing on it's it's we, we we focus on renewable energy because 
energy is such a big component of greenhouse gas emissions. So the, the, the coal that we burn um, emits a huge amount of the, of the greenhouse gas emissions. But it's not only renew energy that we're going to have to shift. It's also things like we need to move away from single-use private cars to public transport that is, that, you know, with electric vehicles. And they must be charged on it with electricity that has been generated through renewable energy sources. Um, so we need a, you know, a, an effective, viable public transport system. We need to look at things like changing the way, the, the manufacturing process in many cases. Mm -hmm. um, you know, often the manufacturing processes and industrial processes use coal um, directly, not, not only through, um, you know, through electricity, but directly in the, in the production process. So we need to move away from those kinds of, look at possibilities of moving away from those kinds of, of, of production processes. Yeah. We also need to look at the way we, we grow crops and we farm and how we ensure food security in a country. Um, you know, when we cut down trees to open up more farming land, um, we're actually emitting carbon. When we um, get involved in heavy commercial farming, we're using you know, single-use um, cr crops, so, so, so land that is dedicated to just one crop, um, the heavy use of pesticides and insecticides, all those are actually major emitters of greenhouse gas emissions. So we need to look at how we do um, grow our food, we also need to look at things like how we manage our waste. Um, landfill sites can be a big source of, of methane emissions if they're not well managed. You know, we need to look at how we can move to a society that is actually using, producing and generating um, much less waste. So we need to, to, to move towards zero um, waste at the end yeah. of the day. So, so you can see it's a multifaceted um, process that we need to actually be looking at yeah. as we look to, to decarbonizing society. It most certainly is, and there's a big personal responsibility element, which uh, Sandra you raised, which I like because it, it speaks to what type of vehicles we buy, and you know, going into that sort of market as well, being cognizant of these realities. But Francisca, is there a scenario where we are able to make this transition right now? But earlier we spoke about COP26 and this just transition that they are talking about, and the sort of monies that are being made available uh, for us to invest in the renewable energy. But but is there a sufficient enough catalyst for us to move in that direction? And practically, what does that look like? Is it setting up a whole lot of wind farms along the West Coast and plugging that into the, the national energy grid? On a practical level, what does that transition look like? Yeah, I think most of um, the way that we need to do this is through planning and forecasting. So it's not going to happen tomorrow, even if we had the political will and were fully motivated. It still takes time. Um, and we have still got some time, although 2030 really is, we're starting to look at serious cutoff points and we've got to get started now. And I think what we've seen in South Africa is this stalling of investment in renewable energies. I mean, it's over five years since we've had any new renewable energy. And that's because we haven't had the political will to really start to see those investments. So we need to see the policy levers that allow us to really start to make the changes. Once that starts happening and you see different decisions being made at municipal level, at national government level, then you'll start to see a real change. Sure. And I think Sandra and Yvette were talking about how really we don't have those systems set up right now. Uh, I, I want to stick with, I want stick with that, in Francisca. I just want to stick with yes. that very quickly. Um, you know, the reality is such that in South Africa, there appears to be uh, somewhat of a move towards greener, cleaner forms of energy. There's talk about the independent power producers and some of the availability that's being made, um, an option certainly for our energy sector. But you have an energy minister in the form of Gwedi Mantashe, for instance, that is seeking to approve mining deals along places like the Wild Coast in Kolobeni and other places. And you have a scenario, for instance, where he is calling what just happened at COP26 as a geopolitical imperialist imposition on Africa as such. He, that's the sort of talk that he's coming from. And so at the moment you have what is definitely a very polarizing tone coming from government about what our priorities are. Yes, absolutely. And you're seeing politics being played out there um, that, you know, South Africa gets tons of money for many different things from international actors um, to support different um, 
uh, work that we're doing around healthcare and all sorts of different areas. So to call this money for divestment from coal imperialist um, interventions is really a little bit rich. Um, and it says, suggests, speaks more to his motivation than to anything else. I don't, though, want to focus too much on our current minister because we've had a succession of ministers who've tried to push through nuclear, who've tried to make sure that coal um, power stations continue to function for as long and, and, and put more in place. So it's not this particular individual, but it's a faction within our government who has not shown their commitment to taking climate change seriously. And that we as people who can vote, people who live in South Africa really need to make noise to government to say this actually isn't good enough for us. Yeah. We need to be recognized for what we're doing. Many, many of us are already important parts of the climate change solution. Waste pickers are some of the very important people who are helping us to recycle and to make sure that we don't have these massive landfills, that we aren't polluting so much and, and creating more climate change. So um, all of us, workers and, and governments alike, need to start recognizing the efforts that are being made. And, and really, government needs to start making a serious commitment and get its house in order. We, as, as people within the country, yes, we can make our personal changes, but it's at the structural level yeah. that we need to see change. And that's why we shouldn't get... Um, we should recycle. Yes, absolutely. Please do that. Please feel motivated and inspired. But we also need to make sure that our government is making better decisions on our behalf. We, the public participation in democratic processes is absolutely enshrined in our constitution. And we have every right to hold government to account and to tell them this isn't good enough. Yeah, and, and this comes in and amongst, and I may, there may be a conflation with this question, uh, Sandra, but it comes as Shell is just about to do some seismic activity, sending these pulses down to check if there are banks of, of oil and gas just along our coastline here in Southern Africa. Um, and, and we see the sort of research that's happening at the moment. And I'm quite curious to understand, um, you know, as Francisco submits there, that we need perhaps a government and individual responsibility, but I'm wondering whether this extends to business as well. There are certain quarters in business that have already said, for instance, they will no longer finance coal deals any longer. Um, and that is perhaps one step forward, but how do we collectively as a society begin to make the shift? Because, you know, there, there, are, there are steps in that direction, but I'm not sure whether we've actually seen a shift to try and go to clean, cleaner and greener forms of energy. You see, I think it has to be a publicly driven process. And, and by that, I mean that I actually think government has to take the lead um, not give in to, to kind of big, you know, oil and coal industry interests and actually take the lead in pushing. But I think that that energy, uh, you know, that government has to take the lead and um, a public utility like Eskom has to take the lead in doing renewable energy, in um, moving from coal generation to renewable energy. You know, you, you talk about what could big business do, but I think we, we know that big business is, you know, at the, at the end of the day, they're completely driven by the need to make a profit. If they don't make a profit, they simply go out of business. So they're not going to do things which harm their, their, um, their, their, their profit line. Now, we've got a situation in South Africa where we need to move away from, from coal. We want to move towards renewable energy. But we also have huge numbers of people who don't have access to electricity at the moment. So we've got a huge um, amount of energy poverty. So we need a situation where um, electricity generation is happening through renewable sources in an equitable way so that everybody is actually getting access to that electricity. Um, not, not just access, you know, well, if you, if you pay for it, you get it, but yeah. access in terms of um, it must be affordable, you know, that, it must be there for people to use sure. um, as part of improving quality of life. So, so and, I, and, I, think, and I think, you know, that's... at the bottom, unless government is pushing this process, yes. um, it's not going to happen through the private and sector. And I think that's the fundamental point, that all of us have a role to play and can even begin with a personal response, sense of personal responsibility that all of us can take. Thank you very much. We're going to have to conclude on that very pertinent note. Francisca de Gaspens, there, the director of SAFSI, having spoken to us. Sandra van Kerk to the end there, the project coordinator of Public Services international. Dr. Yvette Abrams joined us, but she's from QLI Project 9020. Thank you.
very much for this very insightful conversation. And with that, we conclude this week's edition of Workers' World Labor Show. From myself to Sherik Trubad and the entire team, have a lovely day. <laughs>